Uh, technology circles have been ruminating all weekend on how Facebook's platform is being used to spread false news. Some say the network had a hand in shaping the outcome of last week's presidential election. Some, including CEO Mark Zuckerberg, say that's downright crazy talk. One thing is for sure, people are divided, including members of Facebook's engineering staff who disagree with Zuckerberg's stance. They are reportedly forming an unofficial task force within the company, uh, meeting in secret to formalize a list of recommendations to offer up to senior management to improve the false news conundrum. Facebook apparently has warned its staff from speaking to the press. So, you know, this was like five or six sources that spoke to BuzzFeed, all independent, all anonymously, but just basically saying like they do not agree with the company uh, kind of stance, line in the sand, and uh, they want to do something about it. They say there are tools that already exist to battle all sorts of things on the network, including offensive, harmful, harmful content, uh, content that doesn't meet community standards. And they're saying, why can't it be applied in this case? Yeah, if they can do it and they're not doing it, then uh, that that is a good big question. But for me, I feel like it comes down to uh, people should be responsible for figuring out if something's true or not. They should mm -hmm. be doing that on their own. Like, you know, when email first began and people started, like, you know, your, your relatives would send you that email that says, Bill Gates will pay you $5 for every person that you email this to. <laughs> like, we didn't go to the email providers and saying, you're, make, you're making it possible for these people to spread these fake news. We said, no, tell your friends, tell your family, that's too good to be true. That's not true. And, you know, yeah. we didn't blame the email providers. I know this is a different story and I know this is bigger, but I, I feel like to just blame Facebook for um, the, you know, influencing the election, I think everybody wants to blame someone if, if they yeah. want to blame someone. Every, everybody who wants to blame someone wants to blame Facebook. But, you know, I just think it's people's responsibility, their own personal responsibility to, to you know, to figure out uh, what news they're spreading. Yeah, and I think the challenge here, especially in this regard, is that there, you know, where do you draw the line? Like, on one hand, I understand, right? Like, it, it feels a little bit like sour grapes to to kind of go back after the fact and be like, yeah, well, you know, you made this all happen because I don't agree with the outcome or whatever. Um, on the other hand, there is such thing as a network effect, and when you're talking about something like email, that's a very one to one kind of thing. And Facebook a single story can take on a life of its own specifically because hundreds of thousands of people suddenly get on and legitimize it by liking it, sharing it, moving it onward. And so it takes on a life of its own, probably more so in, in more of a public, uh, you know, maybe a, a certain trustworthiness sort of way than say something on email that goes one-to-one -one and then maybe it's spread out a little bit, but you don't really get that net network effect. So that exists. But where do you draw the line? Because if you're saying things that aren't true shouldn't be posted on Facebook, which is kind of part of what's what's here. I mean, there are lots of things that aren't true that are posted on Facebook. It's stuff that's posted as true, but conveyed as as not as or, you know, stuff that's untrue that's conveyed as true. That seems to be the problem here. But like our jokes, should you not post jokes? Is that, you know, does that get through this uh, through this kind of line of defense? I don't know. Right. I mean, because they, they've been working on the hoax, you know, is, is it someone purposely trying to spread fake news or is it just, you know, like an onion type thing? They've been mm -hmm. working on that for a while. And, you know, I agree with what you're saying about the network effect. I mean, there's been psychological studies that say that if people hear things from like four or five different sources, they're going to believe them. Uh, so, again, that's up to people's responsibility. Check your source. And, you you know, people need to you need to tell teach schools need to be teaching this sort of thing like sure. the Internet. Um, and, you know, you used to say, like, just don't check Wikipedia, uh, you know, don't use Wikipedia as your source. But it's really just like no, know your source. Like there are so many bad sources out there. So I, I don't know. I mean, I just I think there are so many reasons this election turned out the way it did. And maybe Facebook is one of them. But you can mm -hmm. look back to the turn of the century before there was media. I mean, this was the same the same thing happened. People there were people living in the cities. There were people living in the country. And then media started to trickle in. more information tr started trickling. And people living in the country said, what are the people in the cities doing? And, you know, the people in the city said the same thing. And mm -hmm. everyone feels like their way of life is being challenged. And that's what's going on a little little bit here with Facebook. So it's something we've seen in history. It's happening again, not just Facebook, but Google and Twitter and all of that. So, you know, and it, and it just, I mean, we're, we're, we're a big country with a lot of different people with a lot of different ideas. And uh, yeah, so I think, I don't know if they, if they know a way to fix it, I think they should do it, but I don't know how you fix it.
Yeah, I don't know how you fix it and make everybody happy. I don't think that's uh, that's possible. There is one thing that is that is evident to me in all of this, which is that social, and this kind of ties into the next story, that social media as we've been using it is way more influential over our lives collectively than I think we give it credit for. At this point, over the last 10 or so years, we've gotten very used to, like I figured this out over the weekend, a quarter of my life is devoted to sharing my, my feelings, my emotions, my thoughts in a very public way through social networks. What then happens to that information? How does that influence the decisions that I make in my life and how, what other people make in their life? Sure, people should, you're right, should take accountability for the things that they read and everything like that. But a lot of people don't. And a lot of people are very happy to see their own biases confirmed in what they read. And that's good enough. And that's where I think some, you know, this kind of has an important quality to it. It's like, okay, well, then if it's not happening, what, what is the damage that can be done if you continue in large numbers, you know, dealing with your life and living your life in that way? It can have dramatic side effects. I don't know if the responsibility of that falls in Facebook or if it falls in the user. It's probably a little bit of both. Well, The Verge reports that the FBI has contracted with data analytics firm Dataminer to get full access to Twitter's Firehose. Now, the public Twitter API only offers access to 1% of the tweets on Twitter. The deal was struck last week, according to NextGov. That's an information resource for t technology decision makers in government. Dataminer will use advanced tools to help the FBI root out terrorist organizations and other criminals with real-time data crunching. But many are worried about what the FBI's partnership with Data Miner says about the future of our privacy. Now, unlike other Twitter analytics firms, Data Miner lets the FBI customize its filters based on changing circumstances. So to me, that sounds like that slippery slope we're always talking mm -hmm, about with privacy. Sure. Uh, what are they going to do with it in the future? What, what you know, if we say, oh, okay, like they're just trying to find the terrorists uh, now, um, but what will they do with those tweets in the future? 200 licenses for data miners, indicators and warning service. So that's a special service they had. And of course, we talked about this in May. Twitter um, shut off the CIA's data, data miner access. So the, the Verge reported this and they, they tried to contact... Uh, the FBI and find out um, how is this different than what the, you know, why they wouldn't let the CIA have it, uh, what's different, but the FBI didn't get back to them yet. Yeah, I mean, we also heard about this, I think it was last month with Geofigia, and, uh, you know, that that kind of realized uh, revealed how much of all of this public information is being tracked and, and monitored and, and used by intelligence agencies. Um, obviously, on one hand, I understand, like, intelligence agencies need access to information that's going to make their job uh, easier, give them the tools to do good, let's say. Um, but like you say, like at what point, like there's unintended consequences in that too. And the long-term ramifications of all that information being accessible, being searchable to come up with own, you know, their own conclusions. I, I think we're just starting to realize the power of what it means to put out all this free information into these public forums. And then what can be done with that? Mother load, or sorry, mother board, uh, had a very interesting article, and they're looking at a conference in London. It's happening this week. It's targeted at senior military and intelligence officials, and it focuses almost entirely on social media as a source of intelligence and influence over public opinion. Um, so, for example, one session involves social media being an open source intelligence asset, finding information, hiding in plain sight. Uh, you know, it's it's all about intelligence gathering and behavioral monitoring on a grand scale based entirely on social networks and information that people are willingly giving for, you know, in trade for for what? For targeted advertising and, and free services. And I mean, it's stuff we talk about on this network all the time. Like, it's okay. I'm, I'm cool to give over this information because I love the services that I get on the other side. I think the, the risk, the challenge, uh, the possible, you know, downside to that is somewhere down the line things change drastically and that that information is used to wep is used as a weapon mm -hmm. and, and that's you know, kind of part of what this is all about exactly like we don't know the world that we're going to be living in next year or the year after i mean at what point are we living in a world where using the black lives matter hashtag suddenly makes you a criminal in right. someone's mind and so you know that's what we're talking about yep absolutely that's it right there